Thank you. Um, my name is Lori and I am grateful to be an alcoholic today. I want to know if I have a timer or should I be keeping my own time? Because I um, can talk. <laughs> well, I'll give you like a five, I'll send you a message five minutes when we're almost at the end. Okay, that would be right. great. And if, right. if, if I'm still talking, just wave your hands. I'll be watching you. Okay. Angel. Again, I am Lori. I'm grateful to be an alcoholic today. That wasn't always the case. Thank you so much, Phil, for arranging for me to speak and giving me reminders and taking care of this meeting. And thank you, Kevin, for your service and everyone else that's here being of service to me. You are being of service to me, but just coming into a meeting, you're helping me stay sober today. So thanks for being here. Um, I didn't hear you guys identify newcomers, but I hope we have a few in here and I hope you stay. And, and it's okay if you don't like what I have to say, just keep going to meetings. You're going to hear something that you relate to. I promise you just keep going to meetings. You'll hear parts of your story and just keep coming back. We say keep coming back, but I like to say stay. Um, so my sobriety date is March 9th, 2010. I have a sponsor who has a sponsor and um, I'm grateful that my life has changed as a result of Alcoholics Anonymous. When I got to these rooms, it was the summer of 2009. And I live in Los Angeles area in, in a really interesting area called Venice Beach, which is just south of Santa Monica in Southern California. And uh, we, we like to say it's where art meets crime. Um, and that's where I've been for the last, uh, I guess, now going on 16 years, but this is where I started going to meetings. Um, I was 39 years old. I was beaten into a state of reasonableness that at least I could see that I had a problem with alcohol. I wasn't really, wasn't really sure yet if I was an alcoholic. Um, and I say that with love in my heart for myself, you know, for who I was then. That's what I was capable of saying is that I could tell that I was a daily drinker. Um, I'm also a mom. My, my two boys were six and eight at the time. And I also have three nephews that I have in my care or used to have in my care quite a lot. And they were, I think they were, let's see if they were eight and six, they would have been 10 and a half, seven and five. So there was a lot of time where I had five little boys under the age of 11 under my care. And frankly, uh, I didn't think I was going to have to quit forever. I came here knowing that I had had a problem because I was drinking daily and I was judging myself and feeling a lot of shame for that, obviously, because I was supposed to be alert and sober, you know, with the kids, I knew better than that. And those are all judgments I put on myself. Um, I didn't like the fact that when I woke up at three o'clock in the morning, I needed to drink in order to quiet the voices in my head so I could go back to sleep. I didn't like feeling angry and resentful at my husband because he got to go to work and I got to stay home with the kids and I thought I got the raw end of the deal at the time. That it fills me with humility to say that, but that's who I was and what I thought when I came here. I really thought that, you know, that my husband had it, had it easier, that he got to go to work and have this, you know, adult conversations and I just had to watch after these wild boys. And, um, it took me a while to uh, work the steps. I switched around to a couple sponsors. My first sponsor had a beautiful Australian accent because they said, find someone who's got what you want. <laughs> so I wanted a nice Australian accent. I just thought that was so exotic and so beautiful. And she had 20 years of sobriety. And she also was very busy career, you know, career woman. And she also didn't have a lot of time for me, which I think was attractive in the beginning. Um, and then I, I jumped around a little bit. And for a while I had two sponsors. That's, that's what kind of alcoholic I am is that I'm gonna tell you certain things and I'm gonna tell you, but I'm not gonna let you, uh, no one's gonna know everything about me. Um, and that's not the case today, thank God. But um, that was who I was when I walked in, very distrustful, very guarded. Felt like this is probably a cult. You guys, you guys hold hands, you said we're, we don't collect money, but you do collect money. I was confused and judgmental in my head. And I was also really foggy from so many years of drinking. My first drink was when I was 12 years old and I didn't become a daily drinker at that point, but boy, did I love it. I was in love with that feeling of power greater than myself that 
took, I'm, I'm talkative. It took my voice away and it was a whisper. And I took a big swig off of Bacardi 151 in the, in the stairway of my apartment building in Chicago, where I lived at the time with my two best friends, Mark and Todd. And I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be one of the boys and I wanted to be tough. And I took that drink and I went to say, that's some good stuff. But all that came out with this whisper, like that's some good stuff. And that this bottle, what was in this bottle took away my voice, a power greater than myself. I couldn't have done that. So, uh, you know, it wasn't until much later, many, many years later that I became a daily drinker, but it tells us in our literature that it's a progressive illness and it was for me. Uh, and I don't know if I was born an alcoholic, but certainly by the time I got here, I realized that I was an alcoholic, an alcoholic like me. I was an alcoholic because I drank when I didn't want to. I drank because I felt I had to. And then I hated myself for it. I drank when I have had feelings that I couldn't hold in my body when I was angry and then didn't feel like I had a right to be angry at my husband for being a provider and having a job. I knew that wasn't right. And I knew I had these beautiful kids to look after. And then I didn't feel this gratitude that I felt should come with motherhood and all of that confused me. And it just led to a drink and another drink and another drink. And so when I came here in uh, the summer of 2009, I had been in a wheelchair. I had broke my foot in a, in a drunken stupor. In fact, I crushed three metatarsals by trying to move a heavy, heavy, heavy uh, concrete slab in my backyard, thinking that if I used a towel and used leverage and it fell right on my foot. And, um, and for my boy's birthday, which we went to Legoland, I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't go on any rides with him. I, I was of no use to anyone. Um, I didn't get, that happened in May. I didn't get to AA until August because I was being given pain pills, don't you know? And I was gonna use all that and combine them with the alcohol. But what really scared me and why I really came into the rooms was that alcohol stopped working. Everything stopped working. I was drinking, I was taking whatever I could to not feel and the feelings were still rushing in, the feelings of inadequacy and resentment. And why me? And is my whole life gonna be full of suffering and the inability to see any of the beauty in my life, just all of the hardship. And, um, and also that self-loathing of judging myself for having those feelings in the first place. And uh, I wasn't this articulate. I didn't know this was going on. This is 13 years in retrospect. So I'm just able to see that through, you know, through several inventories, through talking with, you know, our, our fellow travelers, through talking with my sponsors over the years. So I do, I do owe a great deal of gratitude for being able to see that that girl, even though I was 39, that young girl that came into these rooms had no idea about the disease of alcoholism and how it was absolutely running her life and it was robbing her family of a wife and a mother. And um, I have so much gratitude for Alcoholics Anonymous for telling me, keep coming back, stay. You know what, get a sponsor, commit to a meeting a day. Did you drink every day? Go to a meeting every day. Everything I needed to know about Alcoholics Anonymous, you guys told me in those slogans, in the first 30 days that I started coming to meetings, it all ends up being true. I just need to worry about 24 hours, you know, and sometimes if that's a lot, let me just chunk it down to five minutes. Where am I going to be in five minutes from now? Who do I need to call? What is my next course of action, the next right action? So when I came in, I was broken, judgmental about you, about the program about these steps. I looked at the steps on the wall and I thought, yeah, maybe like the first step. Yeah, I was powerless, but manageability, I did not understand that unmanageability. Yeah, I know what it takes to manage. It takes this much alcohol and this much this and this much that. I didn't understand. And that's okay. If you're new and you don't understand what's going on, you're so welcome. And we love you so much. And we're going to be patient with you. And that was what was afforded to me is I realized now when I came in, I was a crazy person talking and all this judgment. I'm not sure if I'm an alcoholic, but just have a seat, little lady, you know, <laughs> we're glad you're here. You know, just kindness and phone numbers and you're in the right place and welcome home. And something about that language of the heart, even though I didn't really understand what you guys were saying, I had never been afforded that kind of patience and tolerance. 
and that kind of love without knowing me and the terrible things that I had done, you know, you guys just loved me. And, um, and then I got really suspicious. What do I got to do? How much is this going to cost me? Right. Um, I had been to therapy for many years by the time I came here because my husband sent me because he thought something was wrong. I was very, very secretive about my drinking. I always drank clear liquid. It looked like I was staying hydrated. It was sake. It was vodka. It was anything that was clear, but it wasn't water. Um, and uh, therapy didn't really do very much. First of all, I have to own that. <laughs> I wasn't honest with her about my drinking. There's the first thing. So what was I doing, right? I was going in there until one day she said, this was years after I'd been seeing her, said, you smell like alcohol. And it was 11 o'clock in the morning. And I said, oh yeah, I had a lot to drink last night. Lie. I lied to people that were there to support and help me get better. And I forgive myself because I've been able to move through and, and know that I was a sick person at that time. I was paying this woman to lie to her. Oh, the insanity. So there's that step two is like that insanity that I lived at with those lies, that dishonesty, first to myself and then to others all around me. Um, I did not think that I was going to stay. I thought I was going to get my tolerance back and that it was going to work again. And I did drink again in December of 2009 after coming to meetings pretty regularly. I went to a holiday party that was for all the moms at my kid's school. It was about 25 moms or something in my kid's class. It was like a kindergarten class. And it was the middle of the day, like noon or one o'clock. And I was trying to go to a meeting every day and not drink between meetings. But when I walked in, I hadn't worked the steps yet, of course. But um, I walked in and there were all these little, they're called Prosecco. It's like a champagne, like a cheap champagne. And they had little pomegranate seeds at the bottom of it. And I, I looked at this tray that was waiting for me when I walked in with my two little kids and my hand was reaching for it. I, I, I didn't even, I was defenseless against that first drink. I saw the pomegranate seeds and I said, oh, it's, it's a health tonic. Well, I'm not even gonna get, I'm not even gonna get a buzz by the time I, you know, I was swallowing it down. I'd already convinced myself that it was a health tonic, that, you know, it was like going to the bar and drinking milk before whiskey. It was that insanity. Then the insanity that followed after I left that party with my two little kids. I don't know if I got drunk or not. I don't remember the particular, but I do remember driving my two little boys to the store so I could get alcohol because I knew I was going to have to restart my days. And if I was going to have to restart my days, I better really drink. Isn't that sick? But I am so grateful for that last drink. I saw my alcoholism, how it plays out. And how cunning and baffling. You put a little pomegranate seed in a Prosecco and all of a sudden my disease has the upper hand again. And it scared me because I had been going to meetings and taking chips for a while. And then um, it was getting to be uh, time for me to take a 90 day chip. So I reset my date. It was first, it was like in August and then it was October and then it was December. And then um, it was getting time for me to take a 90 day chip in March. And uh, my sponsor said, hey, you, you got your 90 days, don't you? And I said, I got to talk to you after the meeting. And I said, hey, I, I, uh, I haven't had a drink, but I smoked something. Do I have to restart my days? She said, well, you know, when's the last time you smoked and how long, you know, how, how's this going? And I said, I, I, I smoked March 8th. And, um, and she said, that's up to you if you want to restart your day. And she gave me permission to own my own sobriety. So my sobriety date is precious to me. It's March 9th, 2010. And I earned it. You know, I really, I, it was a gradual surrender. You know, for me, it wasn't, I wasn't struck with a white light experience, but it was gradually surrendering that ego and that arrogance that I thought I would be able to do it my way, a different way than you guys, that I wouldn't need all of the steps. I wouldn't need to do it the way you did it. And that's not true today. And um, I'm grateful that I got to stick around long enough. And my first year of sobriety, I was angry and I was discontent and I was restless and I didn't take it out on you guys. I was proper and behaved well in the meetings because you guys love me back. But between my husband and I, those are the amends I had to make for my attitude and my behavior in my first year of sobriety, which is really humbling to admit. 
but I was ugly when I got home. I was still angry at him because I hadn't worked my steps and saw, this is, this is a Cliff Notes version, what I discovered in my, in my four step around my resentments around him is that I had made him a higher power and he was a really crappy higher power. But what I discovered was he was a really pretty decent, amazing husband and father. And he was a good provider and he loved me enough to let me to go to a meeting every day. And he would sometimes watch the boys so I could, you know, skip bedtime routine, which was always triggering for me. And I discovered that only through doing the four step. And I had pages and pages of resentments on him. It was basically the same one or two resentments over and over again, playing out in different situations. But he was supposed to read my mind. He was supposed to take care of me. That's my higher powers job. And that's only when I'm honest with my higher power. It was never my husband's job to make me happy or read my mind or make me feel fulfilled or validate me that I'm worthy. That's up to my own self through self-worthiness, through practicing the principles and through building a connection with my higher power, which is really where I get fed, which is where I get my validation, where I get my, where I get that. It was never, it's never a human, even a sponsor, a sponsor can say, great job. You were brave on your fifth step. That was a beautiful job you did with your A step. I can get that validation, but really what I'm lacking, that God's God shaped hole inside me that I tried to fill with things that I drank and things that I smoked, it can only come from one source. Um, but I'm so glad that I got to be mess when I got here. And I'm also very, you know, grateful that people loved me through it. And maybe they judged me and maybe I ended up on some people's four steps, but you all acted proper and nobody told me to the, my face, at least, that I was arrogant and judgmental. So I got to sit with that until I was ready to release it, until I was so sick of it that I was ready on six and seven to say, please, great spirit, remove this from me. I'm so sick of living with this judgmental mind that judges everything. That tree is dying. That flower's pretty. That gum tastes bad. That diet drinks bad for you. You know, ooh, that's my alcoholism. And I, I just want to like, I want to give it away. I want to give that away to a higher power. And I don't get to choose, unfortunately, what my higher power decides to relieve me of and what I have to live with, because maybe it will show up in a way that will help someone else. So I'm probably going to be stuck with some of the stuff that I still don't like, but then I get to practice forgiveness and being an acceptance of like, this is who I am. And there are parts of me that I don't love very much. Where can I be more loving towards myself around those things that I don't like so much? Um, and then this weird mirror thing happens when I work with another, I can spot stuff in them so quickly and I want to point it out. And sometimes it's my job to do so. And oftentimes it's not. <laughs> so I have to wait for them to, you know, discover it through their fourth step or their 10th step. And um, who could have conceived of such a complex but simple program of putting us all together to work this stuff out? Because we're going to have problems in meetings. We're going to have dishonesty and pride and arrogance and self-seeking and selfishness. It's our nature. It's, in fact, human nature, but specifically for this alcoholic right here. It's in my nature. And I have to remember to ask God, to ask my higher power to help me see those things today so I can make choices. And if I'm taking a drink today, I'm not going to be able to be conscious of that. I'll be making mistakes and saying things I don't mean and getting my feelings hurt because my ego gets stepped on. And I think, I think I know what you think of me. And before you know it, I'm making wreckage and I don't want to make any more wreckage. There's enough out there. So I realized that I am just a garden variety alcoholic who has a progressive disease. I also trust those of you that have gone out and try to get back in that sometimes that door is locked for a while. And I have a deep amount of, I guess, fear and respect for this disease is I don't wanna mess around with it. So when a series of pretty horrible things happened, I knew in the back of my mind, it was an option to pick up a drink. When I had three years sober, my sister became homeless because of a, 
um, because of a break with mental health. I mean, she had a psychotic break and those three little boys had to go live with their alcoholic father and I couldn't intervene and it was a court battle and, um, and I wasn't a part of it because I wasn't asked to participate, but I showed up for those boys and she lost custody, which was a good thing because she was not healthy and she moved into a tent right near the LA river and I was in so much fear. And my sponsor had me do fear inventories every single day for four years. I had to sit on my hands and do nothing and wait to be asked. It wasn't my place and there wasn't anything to do. And I don't know if drugs were involved or not and uh, none of my business. And maybe this is rearing into a little Al-Anon, but just side note, if you, if you work with other alcoholics, you qualify for out, you know, Al-Anon. And if you are an alcoholic, you qualify for Al-Anon. I'm my own qualifier. So um, I got to love my sister through that without inserting my own will. And it was painful. Every time I took a shower with warm water, I felt guilt that my, who knew how my sister was getting clean or if she was being abused out there on the streets. And she's not on the streets today. And I'm grateful for that. And I love her. And uh, I don't understand what happened to her. And she's not the same. And um, it's hard. I, I could have really used a sister the last couple of years and she's not available to me in that way. And that's okay because I have a lot of sisters in Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, when my father died and he was, he was an active uh, drug user during my entire life and never got sober, I showed up in the last two years of his life and I got to be on his bedside when he passed away, holding his hand, telling him he loved, I loved him. And there was a whole series of miracles that happened around that. I was out of the country, actually. And I believe that his spirit and his soul hung on in that broken body of his so that I wouldn't have guilt. And uh, when he died, I um, went to a meeting that night and I shared about how angry I was that I wasn't going to, don't you know, and I'm not going to get my amends from my father after all. And um, a little while after that, someone pointed out, you know, I think your father might have made amends to you by hanging around so you didn't have to have guilt about him dying on you when you were out of the country. And I thought, yeah, my higher power speaks through you guys a lot of the time, a lot of the time. And uh, at the start of the pandemic, well, let me just backtrack. You know, the fall of 2019, it was clear that both of my boys were having a love affair with drugs and alcohol. And it had been scaring me, which is one of the main reasons why I really committed myself to our beautiful sister program, Al-Anon. And um, I was able to bribe kind of my 16 year old into treatment because he wasn't gonna go willingly. And uh, he went first on a Friday and my 18 year old son uh, didn't wanna go and didn't think he needed to. But when his younger brother went in, he said, maybe I need to look at my stuff. And um, he went in willingly on the Monday after my youngest son went in and they were both in treatment uh, for a few months. My 16 year old came home in January that year and thank God has not picked up since. And uh, he's gonna be 20 years old and I'm really, really proud of him. I'm really, really proud of that kid. And my 18 year old stayed in treatment through March of 2020, which as many of you know, at least in our city, the lockdowns happened. All the meetings instantly went away. And he had been collecting chips. At that time, he had about 120 days and he had invited me to uh, some meetings so I could watch him take his 30 day chip and his 60 day chip and his 90 day chip. And I remember that for me, that long wait between the 90 day chip and the six month chip. And I thought, oh kid, hang on, you know, hang in there. So March 9th of 2020, I was taking a 10 year cake and my boy said, we'd like to give you a cake. Oh, and if you're not from California, if you haven't heard, we call it giving a birthday cake out here. You celebrate AA birthdays. So we actually like have either a real cake or a pretend cake and we put candles in it and we sing happy birthday. And uh, we, I took them to a, a meeting that I knew that they regularly attended that used to be one of the speaker meetings on the mainstay for my early sobriety. It's a real good, good meeting here in, in, um, in person, you know, obviously. And uh, before I went up to take my 10 year cake, my boy said, my 18 year old said, mom, before you, you know, when you thank us for your 10 years, cause he knew I was gonna thank him for giving him a cake or for giving me a cake. Can you call us out by name? Can you use our names? 
And I said, absolutely, I sure will. He said, instead of saying just, I want to thank my sons for giving me a cake, you know, say my name, Noah and Toby, Kobe, my younger son. And I said, I will. And he brought his sponsor. He was so proud of me and wanted to be associated with his sober mom, which is a gift of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is not anything that I did on my own. This was you guys and what you had done with me. And um, I think about that a lot, about how much that meant to me that my boys wanted to be affiliated with me in a room of Alcoholics Anonymous. And maybe it made them look like big shots to the girls because they were starting to flirt and go to meetings and having a, a big social scene around the fellowship. And I was so proud of them. And um, literally uh, two days later, all the meetings were gone. My son Noah was living in treatment at a residential that he was expected to stay and live at for the next year almost because they put him into work program and he was gonna go back to school. He had been a senior in, uh, in high school. And um, I went right on to meetings immediately on Zoom and I'm so proud of Alcoholics Anonymous for showing up and immediately starting meetings. We didn't wait to get the call from central office. It's okay, go ahead. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, we did it because we needed it. We needed it immediately. This was an unprecedented situation. It was a global pandemic. We needed each other and we knew what to do. We wanted to be there for the newcomers. And I'm so proud of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went to multiple meetings a day because I was starting to freak out. So Noah checked himself out. He was 18 and he could, and we, we fought with him. Um, I mean, we didn't. We said, we don't have any power here, but we strongly suggest you stay put. He didn't want to be locked in. Um, my son, Toby, went to a few Zoom meetings. Wasn't really his thing. He didn't like it, but he did have a sponsor. Um, Noah refused to go to any Zoom meetings. Contempt prior to investigation. Just like this alcoholic. How humbling to see that on my son. Um, and because he had been locked up a couple of times because of hospitalizations, because of drug-induced psychosis, he had some trauma around being locked into a room with his roommate and he didn't want to be there. And I get it. He didn't want to listen to his parents or his counselors who urged him to stay, that he would be safer there than out here. And um, I learned later that a whole bunch of the older guys, he was also at an adult facility and he was 18. He was the youngest guy in there. They sat on him that he wouldn't, you know, so that he wouldn't leave. And finally, he just threatened that he was going to call his drug dealer if they didn't get off of him, that he was going to get kicked out. You know, he wanted to leave. He wanted to run so badly. So I know that there wasn't anything that we could have done as his parents or as people that loved him to keep him there. But he left. And, um, and Noah did not make it. He died of this disease on April 21st, 2020. And... Um, I went to a meeting that night on Zoom. The same thing that you guys taught me to do is like get in the room. And I did not drink or use, but I became a newcomer again. I desperately clung to this program like I never did before even because now I knew. Now I knew that I needed not to drink. I didn't want to hurt myself. I didn't want to cause more wreckage for my, you know, for my husband, for my son, for my, for my son's grandparents, for my in-laws who, who loved my kids just as much as I did. And there was an outpouring of love from Alcoholics Anonymous. You guys told me these things that I used to roll my eyes at, like you never have to do anything alone if you don't want to. You never have to do anything alone. And you don't have to drink again. And I would roll my eyes at that. I thought, I don't know. I don't know if that really is true. And I'm here to say it is 100% true. Not only did I not have to drink, but this miracle happened to me. I didn't want to drink. And a part of me just did the, did the mental exercise. Like, I know I could call a doctor. I know I could get sedatives. I know I could get sleeping pills. I know I could get tranquilizers. I know I can numb out right now. And I didn't want to. Who is that? That's not the girl that walked into these rooms. Wanting to feel what she was feeling and wanted to lean into you guys and let you see and let, give you a chance to hold me up. And I did not have any strength to do this on my own, but I trusted that the group could hold this. The group that my higher power could hold this pain, that I did not have to carry this pain alone. 
And my higher power gave me the idea to reach out to two women who I knew that had lost children in sobriety and didn't drink. And I called those two women and I said, how do you do it? How do you not drink when this happens? And they told me one day at a time, the same stuff that works for early recovery happens to work for grief. All this practice, writing a letter to God, writing your resentments, naming your feelings, telling the truth about yourself, being visible, calling your sponsor. It happens that all that stuff works with deep loss and grief too. And it works, it really does. People say, oh, you're so strong, you're so resilient. I don't know if I could survive it. And uh, it's not me, I guarantee it. It's because I surrendered little by little who I was so that I could just be rebuilt into what it looks like to be a trusting member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't always believe that a higher power existed. I believed that something was out there. I didn't really think it paid attention to little old me, but I thought maybe he believes, I'll believe in his higher power, or maybe she believes. And then for a while, my higher power was a group of drunks or the great outdoors. And for a while, it was just a big question mark in the sky. And that was the extent of my higher power. Like, I don't know. I still don't know. But at some point, someone said something wise, like, do you need to understand this higher power in order to trust it? And I thought, hmm, no, I don't, I don't know if that's a prerequisite. So I can trust something that I don't understand. I did. I just, I made a decision. I made a decision that I'm going to trust something that I can't understand. And it works. It really does. I can trust that I don't have all the answers and I want to attach myself to something that's bigger than me because me of my own accord is very limited when it comes to what I judge or what I think is right. It's very narrow, but my higher power, which today I call great universal spirit. Sometimes I call divine one. Sometimes I call great spirit. Sometimes I call goddess. Sometimes it's great grandmother tree. I believe that this higher power knows what's best for us. Not for me. It's not about me. It's about us. I am just a tool. And sometimes that's very humbling. And I have a choice about, you know, I had a choice about shutting down after my son died. I knew that I could crawl into a cave and never talk again and drink myself into a stupor and not interact with the outside world. And that was um, sort of what my father did. My father had lost a child before I was born. It was from his first marriage and he was estranged from that son who was a teenager. And my father became a severe drug addict. And I had a choice to, to do grief differently. Without Alcoholics Anonymous, I wouldn't have had the perspective. I wouldn't have been able to make amends to my father and I wouldn't have been able to find my part in the relationship, nor would I have been able to make amends living amends and be there with him. A lot of healing took place. I don't resent my father for being a drug addict. I absolutely have released all of my anger to him. I feel compassion for him that he lived such a guilt-filled life, full of self-loathing, full of that loss and grief that he was never able to express with other people because he felt it was all his fault and that he caused. I don't know. I'm making up a story now. I don't really know because I wasn't in his head, but I'm not doing grief the way that he's doing grief. And I believe that recovery and sobriety has saved me from that fate because it looks sad and it creates a lot of wreckage and a lot of trauma to people that love you and witness that. And Alcoholics Anonymous taught me to be the daughter that I wanted to be to him. People would say, why are you showing up for your father? He was never there for you. He didn't support you. He didn't even understand your recovery. You know, he did. He didn't want to admit it. He would say, oh, I don't understand drunks like you, you know, Alkies. <laughs> he called me a name, right? And I said, but, you know, isn't it the same thing? And he, no, you know, he wasn't a drunk. <laughs> he, was an, he was an addict. He was never really honest with it. But I said, it's not about him. It's about who I want to be. 
I built a lot of self-esteem around becoming the daughter I wanted to be to him in my 40s. You know, it's never too late. And I'm still making amends to him in the way that I live my life as a parent today. And I am so, I'm so blown away by the beauty in this program that we're in a meeting of how many people? Oh my gosh. I mean, it's mind blowing. 152 people here. And there's 151 people in this room that know something that I don't know. If I had time to talk with each one of you, and there's sometimes there's two people in a screen, I could learn so much if I humble myself to not knowing everything. I can leave this meeting if I were to spend five minutes talking to each one of you. That's the wisdom, the wisdom to know the difference. It's from gathering information from one another. And you know something that I don't know. And I love that. I don't have to know how to do this. Oh, I just felt like a little achiness in my heart. I can pay attention to my body today too. Like my body has so much information when I'm tired. As a, as a mom, I was always pushing myself and then resenting the fact that I had to do all this stuff that I didn't want to do. I, um, I can feel that. I can feel stuff in my body. When I was newly sober, I felt stuff I hadn't been willing to feel for a very long time. And a lot of it was upsetting, but some of it was joyful. And I was scared of the joy too. I was scared. I think I was always scared. When, when I had kids, I knew, oh no, what if something happens? My greatest fear happened. Something happened. I lost my son to this disease. He's not lost. He's with God. And he's with me all the time, in some ways, even more profoundly than when he was here on earth. And he has sent me a multitude of signs and songs because our love of music is something that we shared and art. And I connect with him daily as I do with my higher power daily, because that's where I find this love and this peace and this serenity. It's not in the alcohol that I was chasing. It was not in the drugs that I was using to try to combine to get the effects to work from alcohol that I had lost for many years. It was not there. It was never there. But it is here in these rooms, in the breath, in the exhale, in the moment. So I have my son's big book and I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud that he got a sponsor. I'm so proud of him that his sponsor told him, I knew he was doing it, but I didn't ask. His name in there and his sobriety date, 11, 18, 19. And then he has a yellow highlighter and he's highlighted a ton of stuff in Bill's story and in the doctor's opinion. And I'm so proud of him for beginning the work in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm surprised at the stuff that jumps out to him in Bill's story, first of all, in my story, I didn't read Bill's story until I was almost a year, maybe over a year sober. My sponsor knew that I couldn't focus because I was too crazy. And I was only allowed to read the stories in the back of the books and go to meetings every day. I couldn't focus enough on the big words. So he got further than I did you know, in the beginning. And um, when I read Bill's story, I thought, oh, this is exhausting. Like he keeps on relapsing and he keeps on using and he knows it's not good. And he knows he's an alcoholic and he relapses. I didn't see the similarities. That was my story too, you know, but I didn't see it, but my boy did. He saw it. And so in these yellow highlighted sentences, I can meditate on one of those sentences. Far from admitting he was an alcoholic, he told himself he came to the hospital to rest his nerves. I can, I can have a discussion with Noah in meditation about that. Yeah, I can see how that would relate. Tell me more, you know? And I can ask my higher power to be part of those conversations. So it's not just me being delusional, having a conversation with my son. And there's a sad fact that my son only got and this. I'm saying this for the newcomer and to my, and to my, myself, my, you know, my past self, he only got to page 57. He never got into chapter five, how it works. That's where his highlighting ends because he was a pill taker and because he bought drugs off Instagram or social media and because of fentanyl and he knew what he was getting it he wasn't a victim he was a victim to this disease yes but he didn't have the chance if he was just a straight alcoholic he would have relapsed and come back and relapsed and come back and he would have gotten to be tired of himself enough that he would have been willing like I was like my story but he 
wasn't afforded the chance. So I'm saying this because some of you in the rooms know that we don't get afforded the chance to relapse a lot when we're playing with other stuff out there. So I just need to say it out loud. Please stay. Please give yourself a chance to work through all 12 steps before you decide that this doesn't work for you. Please don't give up on yourself before the miracles begin to unfold in your life. You don't know yourself yet. I didn't know myself until I was almost three or four years sober. And thank God that I was afforded many chances to be rude to my husband and short with my kids and ugly behavior wise that I didn't make so much wreckage that I couldn't correct it. I'm still married to that man. We're, we're coming up on 26 years. My son, um, who was 16, who lived through his only brother's death and his, you know, his best friend and his using buddy didn't relapse. And that's not because of me. That's because of his higher power. And that's because of his own program and whatever he's doing. And it's also none of my business. I get to love him and give him props and, you know, congratulate him on his milestones. But if we don't give our chance, ourselves a chance to see who we are, which sometimes take, you know, sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, this alcoholic was sometimes slowly. And I don't know why I got a chance to live long enough to figure out. And I do believe that my mission on earth is not done. And I don't know if staying sober and talking to you guys is part of my mission or if there's something greater that's waiting out there for me. I get to keep on praying about that and to ask for, you know, to ask for guidance from a higher power. Oh, I'm not paying attention to the time. It must be close to the time. About, oh, hold on a second. I'm not seeing. 10 minutes left? Okay. Ooh. What has been so exciting is, is seeing that how I can help others in grief. And coming through the pandemic, we all live through a lot of grief, a lot of loss. And maybe we all, you know, the human condition is, is loss. You know, we're born and we die, we get sick. There's loss in all of that. And maybe my work and maybe my mission is around grief work, I don't know. But I know that if I don't stay sober and don't keep going to meetings and don't keep on participating in my sobriety, but I don't get to find out what's around the next corner. And it could be full of joy in watching people heal from grief. And that is tremendously important to me. So I do, I do have a curiosity that I never had before Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to talk about just briefly, you know, what it's like to work with others and how important. If you're a newcomer and you feel bad about picking up the phone because you don't want to bother your sponsor, you don't know how much my sponsees saved my life over the three years of loss because I couldn't help my son because it wasn't my job. And I also, I couldn't sponsor him. I was told that I get to sponsor others who are willing and want the help. So if you're a newcomer or if you're struggling and you're not a newcomer, but it's hurting inside and it's self-harm or drinking is starting to look attractive, you do not know how that is being used by your higher power to help someone on the other end of that phone call. We have no idea, but we are connected. We are designed to connect human beings. And we do that really well in Alcoholics Anonymous. So please reach out. If you are in pain and drinking or self-harming is looking like an attractive solution, that might be a signal from your higher power that somebody else needs you to be willing to do that. I do think that this is a magical program. I still can't figure out how it all works, even though it's specifically spelled out. I am so, so very disappointed that Noah did not get to live long enough to work with others. He was very interested in going into schools and talking with young people because people are, have access to drugs and alcohol younger and younger. And he never got to sponsor anybody. He never got to talk to a school. He never got to talk to those kids. And he didn't get to have that 12 step, you know, that spiritual awakening as a result of a spiritual awakening, we get to carry this message. But you know what? I get to carry his message and my surviving son, Toby, gets to carry his message. And maybe that's saving lives. I get to go into schools and talk about fentanyl because that's how my son died. And I get to warn people about the illicit pills that are out there. And I get to tell newcomers that if you're a pill user, 
You're not getting a, ki- a pill that's laced with fentanyl. It's all, pe- it's all fentanyl. I get to talk about the facts of, of that. This is not part of my program, but this is part of the service work that I do. I do not get money for that. It's something that calls to me. It is very fulfilling to be able to hopefully save some lives. And I also get to dump, not decide, you know, it's not also not up to me. Um, when I say that I became a newcomer again, I'm grateful that I became desperate. I, I had a sponsor that I had had for five or six years at that point when my son died. And I called her every day and I told her the truth about what I was feeling. I leaned on people that had been through what I had been through. And I guarantee if you're going through something hard right now, that's painful. There is someone who is sober in these rooms that have gone through it. That doesn't, you know, that doesn't feel burdened by you asking, how do you do this hard thing? It is a gift. It is a gift to learn what we've learned and to be able to say, here's how to do it. So when I get a call, I got a call from a, from a neighbor who lo- whose friend lost their son to suicide. He's 25. He was 25. And I get to walk her on this path of being a bereaved parent. I don't know if she's sober or not, but hey, I have three years under my belt of what it's like to live through the death of a child. And I am going to put that to you so that she knows that she can survive this. I feel that in my gut that maybe that's my role is to help parents through the worst days of their life. I don't know, and maybe not. Maybe I get to go back to working at the YMCA one day, and maybe it's through leading a a senior yoga class for movement for Parkinson's, which is something I did before the pandemic, which I haven't yet returned to. I get to pray about that, and I get to say this prayer, which I learned during the fear inventory. I pray only for your knowledge the knowledge of your will for us and the power to carry that out. And when I was a newcomer, I said, why do I have to say us? This is about me, blah, 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 you know? I'm arrogant. I was arrogant. And she said, sweetie, this is not about you. This is about us. This is about the bigger picture. So I get to pray for my higher powers will for us. And I get to be clear-headed because of my 11th step and the first step, not taking a drink in the first place and not taking a think because I can get intoxicated on fear, on joy. I can get intoxicated with rage and, and all those things can be dangerous for me. So if I am clear of the think and the drink, I get to be a channel of this beautiful program's message. And just another word, on God, which I feel comfortable calling God, but if you have traumatic, you know, traumatic religious abuse in your past, I'm so, so sorry. And just please know that you can create your own higher power. It can be a magnificent imaginary unicorn. Just, it can't be you. And I prefer it not be someone that is, that is living. It could be, oh, for a while it was the it was the ghost of Joe H, which is a speaker tape I listened to. So for a while, it was a speaker tape. And, and, and then I found out that he died. And then, and then it was the ghost of Joe H. That was my higher power for a couple of months. Just, it can be the great, not me. But please just get one. And it can be a big question mark in the sky. And then be curious. Hmm, how are you going to show up? So I am grateful so grateful that I get to be here today. I also know that I'm not guaranteed because I'm, I'm a drunk that loves to drink, that thinks pomegranates in an alcoholic beverage is a nutritional drink. And I know that I don't want to go back out there again. And so I keep going to meetings and I keep working these steps and I keep praying. And I, I, I'm still a newcomer in a lot of ways. I only have 13 years. I lived a lot, I drank for 27 years, but, um, I have a lot, a lot of respect for those with more time and I lean into them. And I also have a lot of respect for those with you of less time who have the courage. I'm getting mighty tired of my own voice, but I am so grateful that I got to share with you guys today. Thank you again, Phil, for asking me. Thank you all of you for your service, for being here. I so wish this meeting involved participation so I could hear from you. And I hope I get to see some of you on this beautiful wide path of recovery. I'm so glad to be here today. Thank you for letting me share.